Yo, yo, we're back with the Yo Elliot Show, and today my guest is Carrie Gress, and uh, I've been a big fan of Carrie's work for a couple years since I, well, number one, learned about feminism and the dark side of it, and then returning to the Catholic faith. And so I'd like to talk about that for a moment, but briefly, uh, Carrie is a fellow at the Washington, D.C.-based think tank Ethics and Public Policy Center and a scholar at the Institute of Human Ecology at Catholic University of America. She has a doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America and is the editor at the online women's magazine Theology of Home, uh, which she also has a book by that name, and I bought them all for my wife. <laughs> Carrie has written numerous uh, publications, including for uh, Aladia, Catholic Folk, Catholic World Report, uh, National Review, The Catholic Thing, The Epic Times, The Federalist, The National Catholic Register, The Stream, and The Washington Examiner. She's a frequent guest at Ave Maria Radio, Catholic Answers, EW2N Radio, uh, and Revelant Radio, and has appeared on Fox, BBC, CBC, EW2N, and Russian Times Television. Uh, Carrie has lived and worked professionally in Washington, D.C., and Rome, Italy, and her work has been translated into nine languages. She's also the author of a lot of books, many of which I've read, uh, Nudging Conversations, The Ultimate Makeover, The Marian Option, which I've read, uh, The Marian Consecration for Children, The Anti-Mary Exposed, which was a mind-blowing book, uh, and part of the reason why I invited you here today, uh, The Theology of the Home, which I bought for my wife as a gift for Christmas, uh, City of Spirits, The Pilgrim's Guide to John Paul's Krakow with George Weigel. And her next book, which we're going to talk a lot about here today, which I think you guys are really going to uh, really enjoy this conversation because it dovetails into a lot of the things that we've been talking about. The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us, which is going to be due August uh, 2023. So you can go and check that out on Amazon now and pre-register. Carrie, thank you for joining Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, this is so cool. I'm a fan. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I well, I tell you, you know, um, the first book I read of yours was this one. It came up on Amazon as I was reading books uh, that a lot of guys in the men's space refer to as red pill, right? Red pill books and as they relate to intersexual dynamics and understanding like why is it that men and women are having such a hard time relating to each other today why is dating so difficult why are marriages falling apart and upon my exploration i found the anti-mayor exposed and you did an amazing job of uncovering the dark side of feminism which you do a lot in the new book that we'll talk about uh, but also not just that but gives us an answer and brings us back to the the icon of Mary being a, uh, a, a an example of what a woman could aspire to, but then also the anti-Mary sentiment that uh, we experience in our world. So I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah. No. Thank you. No. It, it was a great book to to write. I, I know it's um it's been an incredible road for it because it got canceled uh four days after biden was inaugurated and um so that was obviously it was actually great for the book um because it got so much more another layer of exposure and sales for it but um yeah i think that the subtitle um the um uh what's the something about toxic femininity is in Rescuing the subtitle the culture Thank yeah you. great subtitle yeah. by the way all the subtitles in your books are cool uh, okay. Yeah, how can I admit, how can I forget that? What is it about? Rescuing the culture from toxic femininity. It's a term that you don't hear too often. Yeah, no, and that was a great term. It actually, uh, came, Mallory Millett is the person who came up with it, uh, really coincidentally, because she actually, she's a sister of Kate Millett, who I talk about a lot in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, she helped Kate come up with the name of her book 60 years ago, um, sexual politics, maybe 50 years ago. Anyway, so it was pretty amazing that she was able to help me come up with that that subtitle for the book with this this notion of toxic femininity. Um, but I think that's why the book was canceled. It was you couldn't buy it on on Instagram or Facebook marketplaces. And and um, really? that was, yeah, that was the, kind of the start of it um, because of that that subtitle. Um, so anyway, that that book, I feel like is 
certainly the first book. And then this next book that I've written is almost like a prequel to it, um, kind of helps sort out a lot of the details of, of the anti-Mare Exposed that are, I don't go into in, in that specific book. Right. It's, it's rare to hear or to see a woman write about feminism uh, dark side or, you know, the other side of the coin there. Um, it seems that feminism is, a, is the narrative or the, the prevailing narrative of the day. I think most of us are feminists and we don't even realize it. You know, I say we because, you know, a lot of men have we yeah. subscribe by feminist theories and we behave in ways that have been molded by feminism. But according to, of course, the, the, your your last book, but really this new book has done an incredible job of delving into the history of feminism. And I even I think I notice a shift in some of your thinking from your previous books to this one, where there was a point where maybe there was a good feminism, you know, maybe when mm -hmm. it first started. But I, mm -hmm. I think that's, I think you've kind of surpassed that <laughs> thought with your new book. And it almost seems yeah. as if feminism ha has a rot from the beginning. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about the roots of feminism? Yeah, so this was really, I think, an interesting thing to dig into because I had always had this sense, like there's obviously, you know, 150 years of feminism that happened before I started writing about it. Because um, my work started uh, really the 1960s and forward in the anti-Mary Exposed. Um, but I always would hear from people, people whom I respect greatly, you know, that that feminism was hijacked. And, I, you know, I thought, OK, that must be the case. It's really been hijacked. And, you know, you can see how it happened with the the communists and and um, the Frankfurt School, you know, all of those other those awful things that happened in the 60s and forward. But I always so, sort of thought, OK, well, there's something more pure and lovely before the 1960s. And um, so that's what I had always wanted to dive into. And it was just a matter of really carving out the time and making the effort to do it. And um, when I did it, I was I was amazed. I mean, it was one of those things where I just thought, this isn't how have we missed this? How are we not paying attention to this? I mean, absolutely, from the very beginning, feminism has been an ideology, and um, it hasn't changed very much. You know, there were uh, there were three pillars that I really was able to t tease out of maybe the first 40 years. Um, and they are the occult, free love and um, restructuring society, which of course became smashing the patriarchy. So those three things are really in play, you know, in these different waves that happen, not not just like, like the first wave, of course, and second wave, but I just mean that you just see this undulation happening throughout um, the movement where these, these three elements are really in play. Um, and actually one of the books that I found most helpful um, was this book called Satanic Feminism that it, it's published, it's an Oxford University Press book. It's someone's dissertation, this author named, um, scholar named Per Fexnell, he's Swedish, I think, um, impeccably researched. I mean, it's, it's very hard to read if you're not an academic because it's an academic book. Um, and I used that book. I was amazed at how much um, the the satanic element, the occult element, really went back to the, almost the very beginning as well. So that that those are the things I was able to tease out of it. But I think as an like an overarching element, the one of the things that just occurred to me, um, you know, looking at these women from the very beginning was just this. You know, there's this deep desire to help women, and it, it comes from a very authentic and good place. You know, these are they, these these women back in the 1790s are seeing all the suffering. They're seeing women really. Um, you know, dying from childbirth, one in 20 women died in childbirth, you know, all these awful things going on. Um, so it was a sincere effort to help, but they, what the problem was is that they were asking this question, how do we help women? But the answer was, we, we need to help them become more like men. Um, and that's really what has, has been the arc of feminism. If you see even today, uh, you know, this is what the whole book goes through. Um, we're asking the question, how do we, how do we make little girls men? How do we make, you know, the whole trans movement? How do we go from all these steps where we've tried to make women like men interiorly and in their fertility and whatnot to the point now where we're actually even trying to make their bodies like men? Um, so it was really amazing to, to see all of this because I hadn't, you know, seen it all of a piece. I haven't ever read a book that actually covered all this. And um, it, it's, it's all there, though. Um, it, you know, it was just really shocking, to, I think, to discover it. Wow. Yeah. And I would imagine that uh, anyone listening to this, particularly women who have you know, adopted the narrative of feminism and, you know, the idea that it's all good and a means by which women have ascended in society, um, mm -hmm. it would be shocking to hear the things that you're saying. Now, you mentioned Satanism as a mm -hmm. as a root cause or uh, a, a, 
uh, how would you say, a catalyst for feminism? How is that the case? Yeah, so the, I think you first start seeing it actually. Um, that Mary Wollstonecraft is sort of considered the first feminist, um, but she passed away in childbirth when her daughter, Mary, well, Mary Godwin, who became Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, when, when she delivered um, Mary Godwin, she passed away like 10 days later. And so um, Mary Godwin ends up marrying Percy Shelley. And, you know, all this is in the book. It's, it, in fact, that was the interesting thing about this book. Every chapter could be its own book because there was just so many details. So trying to keep it condensed, um, what happened was Percy Shelley was, is this well-known um, English poet. And he writes in his work, I mean, he was very much fascinated by, fascinated by the occult. He slept in coffins at night to sort of conjure up the occult. It, it was just part of his ethos. He got hmm. sent... Um, he was it, it removed from Oxford because he wrote a, a, some sort of tr thesis on atheism. Um, and he was just this reckless, reckless character in terms of um, the number of wives and children and dead children all over Europe because of just his really profligate lifestyle. Um, so anyway, he ends up taking these ideas from Mary Wollstonecraft and creating in one of his poems this character named Synthna, who is the first woman in all of poetry and history to not have um, not have any human ties. She has no children. She has no husband. And all she's connected to is Satan, actually. Um, this becomes sort of this first image that gets picked up, you know, during the 1800s by other feminists. And you can see it influencing Elizabeth Cady Stanton and later feminists um, are, are using this ideal of this woman who's completely detached from um, any human relationship. She's not a daughter, she, you know, all of that. So anyway, that's really what started it. And then, of course, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was very much in involved in trying to um, get rid of Christianity altogether. She wrote this thing called the Women's Bible, which is, it's still available. You can buy it. And it's, it's actually laughable. Like just, the, it's like a teenage girl sort of commenting on scripture, you know, just like subjected to submission. I mean, it's just embarrassingly bad. Um, and she had a number of women that, that wrote elements of that as well. And a lot of them, she, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and a lot of the other authors were involved in this um, thing called Theosophy, which was also built up on the occult. They were also very much involved with mediums and, um, you know, the, the spirit table that that is actually at the Smithsonian was the table where all this rapping would happen from the spirits, the conjuring up of spirits um, back in the day. So uh, all of that was very much entrenched in the, the 1800s. And then, of course, it just, you know, followed through um, certainly during the 1900s. But we see a resurgence of it in the 1960s. Early 1900s is more like communism. Um, that's really where communism was perpetuating it. And then later you, you really emer what emerges is, is the occult again back in the 60s and 70s. How do we go from, you know, Satanism, the occult, and of course, communism, uh, to just helping women survive? <laughs> you know, how does that cross over? It sounds like such a far stretch. Like we're talking yeah. about Satan worship, and then it's like, well, we just want women not to die in childbirth or to, you know, yeah. have certain rights. Yeah. And that one of the things that was really fascinating was to see the women that are promoting this, because so many of them were just incredibly broken. In fact, if you notice the the chapters are broken up, the first section is called the Lost Girls. The section, second section are the Mean Girls. And then the third section is No Girls. Um, so you have all of these women who are incredibly broken, who are perpetuating it. And it's through, you know, their ang anger, um, these unhealed wounds that they don't have, that they just feel like, we have to change everything. Um, and, it, you know, I think we all know people in our lives who are like that, that, you know, there's this overreaction. And um, and I think that was really what was motivating. It was just all these awful ideas where they think, you know, if this happened to me, I'm angry and bitter and we've got to change all of it. Um, and you can see how this, this brokenness, and I tried to really focus on it in the book, just, you know, was distributed throughout the movement. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty amazing when you start thinking about it, like just how much... Um, you know, this belief that you had to use those three things to help women, um, that that's kind of just the, the phenomenal part, because a lot of these things are very elemental, you know, things like women getting custody of their children. You know, there was uh, laws that said that if a woman left her husband, he would get the children, even in the case of, you know, any kind of abuse or whatnot. She, she was always sort of left high and dry without the children. Um, you know, basic things like that, that feel very natural law, like 
commonsensical to us today, the fact that we had to upturn all of society through these other elements to get to that point, um, I think is just the amazing thing. And that's what, why people are so confused because they see good things have happened for women, um, but they didn't have to happen in the way that they did happen. You know, the remarkable thing being that they were able to actually use rhetoric and use um, a lot of these really good ideas like getting degrees and custody of our children, th those have been used against us to make us feel guilty. So we have to, they, they've connected so much, the good things that happened with the bad ways in which it's happened, um, that we're not really supposed to pay attention to how it happened. You know, we're just be grateful and move on in a different way. Maybe we didn't have to th literally throw the baby out with the bathwater to, um, to get to this point where women have these kinds of advantages that are feel very commonsensical to us at this point. Right. And so we go from you know, the, the things that you're speaking of now to the title of your book being The End of Woman, uh, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. So how do we get here <laughs> where now what was supposed to be a good idea, what was supposed to be helpful to women actually uh, has destroyed women and uh, you assert is the end of women? Yeah, well, partially because it's really become about power. Um, this isn't really about helping women anymore. It's really about power and who's in control. Um, and you can see that, and this is a section of my book that I call the mean girls. Um, you've got this cadre of women, most of whom are 70 plus, um, who are really dictating what it means to be a woman anymore and how we need to behave. And it's sort of spilling over into Hollywood and all of that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's really what what has has led to it is just this this sense of we have to be really focused on these elite women and what they say. And of course, the elite women are now saying, well, it's OK for women to, you know, for men to actually be women. Um, and so that must be all right. You know, that that's the trajectory that they really have had started with. And this is sort of the final point of it is getting rid of women altogether. But it, there very much has been this this whole effort of control and of power, um, of victimhood, you know, all of these amazing tactics that communism has used for so long um, have really infiltrated the system or infiltrated the feminism and the way that I would say most women in the culture think today. Um, so yeah, it's it's incredibly tragic to see that this is, you know, the, the point at which they're willing to, to take the movement is to get rid of women altogether. Um, because of course, all the, the men that are doing these things are winning the awards, whether it's, um, you know, Leah Thompson winning NCAA swimming meets or, you know, what we're seeing in, in all kinds of other areas where men are trouncing women with certainly with physical ability, but also, you know, we see it in the military as well. Those things, trans women um, winning awards, even, um, you know, Bruce Jenner being the woman of the year. Like this is mm -hmm. unthinkable things that have, I think have happened recently. But because of the ideology that we're dealing with, they just are on track with it. We're definitely at a boiling point, but it's been over the course of at least three generations, uh, I think five decades, that we've seen this slowly sort of unfold. How is it that it creeped into the culture to such a degree that most people wouldn't blink an eye at, uh, at feminism? And if you say anything bad about it, they look at you cross-eyed. Yeah. Well, I mean... The Part of it is there. I have a whole chapter in here about the influence of Betty Friedan and um, Betty Friedan. It's been very well documented, was actually involved with the Communist Party. And you can see all these amazing crossovers. If you look at her book and you look at what what was happening with Marx and Engel and Engels and their work, um, you see that what she's trying to do with her book, The Feminine Mystique, is to push women out of the home. She's and she was very smart about it. She didn't come right out and say women need to go to work. She made a case for how the home is a com comfortable concentration camp, um, which is just remarkable for anybody that's actually ever studied or been to concentration camps that she could actually get away with that that analogy. Um, but she did. And so you had all these women who, you know, were educated, well educated in, in colleges and, you know, like myself, probably didn't grow up with the domestic arts, knowing how to do any of them. So then they, they're home with their children and they don't know what to do. And so it does feel, you know, like a very difficult place to be. So she convinces them using psychology. She convinces them saying, you know, you're victims and you need to get out of this. But all the whole while in the back of her mind is this idea of women will never be free unless we work, um, which of course we know is absolutely a, a, a Marxist idea. 
Um, that's his, you know, Arbeitsmarktfrei. That's the the line that Hitler used at Auschwitz. This idea of work makes you free. Um, so that's that's really where it started. And um, you know, the the you have also the arrival of television. You've got very savvy and sophisticated women like Gloria Steinem, who, um, you know, I've been studying Gloria Steinem now for probably about six or seven years, and I'm just amazed at the things that she's gotten away with saying because they are so silly generally um and but she doesn't have anybody pushing back on her you know you don't have a lot of um conservative women are either ignored or um you know some maligned such that they don't their opinion is really devalued in the culture um so you have and you can even see this like on the that show the view um is another great example of it sometimes there's some pushback there but um for the most part there just hasn't been anybody to check them because women have really just absorbed this like okay this is womanhood and this is how it works and i have to just get on board with this and um this is what's fashionable and this is you know it feels great to be part of a group and you know the sisterhood and uh, you know all of this so they've really done just this amazing job of marketing to uh, this all to us as this is just you know what womanhood is instead of um you know something much healthier and less ideological how does the sexual revolution play into all this sexual promiscuity the pill yeah. and uh, you know sexual liberation yeah so there was a book written by wilhelm reich back in 1936 called the sexual revolution um, which i'm sure you're familiar with and he and it basically makes the blueprint for what will become the sexual re revolution in the 60s um and that's it, it was it, just absolutely fulfilled because he was able to take women like Kate Millett or Angela Davis, um, women that were studying communism underneath him and help push them into both academia as well as culture and disseminate these ideas. Um, and you can see it very much in the 60s. I'm sure that there actually was a lot of money and influence coming from the Soviet Union at that stage. And that might be the next book, really digging into those archives um, at some stage. But um, yeah, I think that that blueprint that Reich created is what what unfolded um, before our eyes and um, was really aided by some some very powerful and engaging personalities who just were able to sell it to people. Um, so yeah, that's that. But along with that, of course, you have the arrival of the pill. And you know, the pills role is so fascinating, because of course, it's the first time in medicine, really, that you have people treating something that's not an illness, that's not a disease. Um, and we can see that now with the trans movement, how that's really led into that um, on multiple layers. One, because they're removing body parts that are not diseased. Um, but secondly, it also just changed the way that we think about human sexuality. There was a, a law professor, Charlie Rice at Notre Dame Law School for years. He's since passed away, but he would always tell his students, you know, this. The, the contraception is going to lead to same-sex marriage and that you know the 70s and 80s everybody's like you are nuts like of course that's not going to happen um and yet here we are it, you know it, it's come to fruition the way that he predicted and much of that is because we took fertility out of marriage and so it's very hard as a heterosexual couple if you're contracepting to say well how is the sexuality i'm experiencing any different than same-sex sexuality. Um, and so that is what really has opened the door in a lot of ways is because we've gotten rid of fertility. And so we think of sexuality just in terms of pleasure and that that's been the fruit of it so that the relationships are no longer have to be fruitful and to see that element. So all of that has, has played a major role into it. We would never have the trans movement. We wouldn't be, you know, same-sex marriage. None of those things I think would have happened if the pill and contraception hadn't been made so widely available to people. So smashing the patriarchy hasn't worked out so well. A lot of people are confused, though, about what the patriarchy is, because you'll get a different definition from different people. I know you've qu yeah. quoted different sites, uh, uh, different people mm -hmm. in your book. Well, if patriarchy is so bad, then why are we failing without it? No, and I think that's the big question. I mean, that there's... Uh, I, I'll address what the patriarchy is in a minute, but I think just looking at the statistics of women's happiness, you know, women are not happier because of feminism. And that's been something that I think the feminist movement is trying to cover up act very actively. Um, depression rates are skyrocketing, STDs are bad, divorce rates are bad. Um, and we also have this really amazing new phenomenon that really points to the fact that women have this deep desire to, to mother 
children. Um, and that's the whole pet craze. I mean, the fact that we now have dog moms and fur babies and, you know, um, strollers for dogs and, you know, things that we never saw before. I mean, pets are pets. And now they've become women's children because they have this unmet desire to actually um, do what they're made to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we're seeing a lot of, of damage. And yet the, the movement just keeps doubling down and saying, well, we just need more feminism and then we'll get to it, which is, again, also with the old communist line, you know, because we haven't really tried communism properly. We haven't it hasn't succeeded. Um, right. That's kind of the idea. Um, but the patriarch really initially Mary Wollstonecraft defines it as um, any hierarchy led by men. So the church is one. Um, the military is another, but you also see it in this paternal role that the father plays in the family where he is meant to protect, provide and, and propagate the family. Um, and those are the things that uh, Kate Millett was probably the most successful in, in getting rid of that um, because she saw that once you start deteriorating the family through, um, you know, loose morals and through prostitution and homosexuality, that the father's authority is no longer people are not valuing it. People aren't, aren't, aren't respecting it. Um, and you can see also how feminism has done that too, where you've got women, you know, the women feel like they sort of wear the pants in the family and they just want their husbands to shut up. Um, and a lot of husbands do, you know, this is, it's sort of been this perfect storm where feminism has found a way to really shut men down. And um, I think that's really the hardest part because it's very difficult for men to even know how do you function in this, um, in this society in which, you know, they've been, fundamentally shut down. Um, so how do we restore that when it's on such a massive level? You know, so many women have bought into this. Um, how do we start bringing that back in a healthy and ordered way? And that's, I think, the big challenge. Yeah, you quote Jordan Peterson in there, uh, how he says that men don't know how to fight with women. Like, it's just, uh, there are no right. rules of engagement. Like, what do we actually do? How do we actually combat this? Uh, right. And so it kind of leaves us in a situation where how do we get back to square one and to where things are? And, and even if you win in the argument, you still lose on an emotional level. You know, there's still going to be something you're going to pay for it somehow, it seems like. So, yeah, I think that's the challenge. I think also I've been amazed, though, by just how well Matt Walsh's mm -hmm. documentary has been received. I think asking that question, what a woman is, has done so much for women um, and the movement in a way, you know, that one simple question, you know, that Socratic question, what is a woman right. has done amazing things. So I'm, I think men have the capacity to be incredibly helpful. It's just a matter of finding the right, the way, the right way in. Um, and Wall seems to have sort of cracked that, but that doesn't really help you on a, on a familial level, other than I think the power of questions go a long way, you know, just starting, starting to ask questions of, um, your wife of your children, you know, those kinds of things and not providing answers all the time, but just letting people speak about things. So oftentimes will bring up the illogical um, inconsistencies that people have, you know, they start thinking, well, maybe I don't really know the answer to that. Like question asking is, is just such a incredible tool um, to use. But I think we need to do more than that. And I think a lot of it has to happen on the side of women starting to educate themselves and realize like, maybe what we have done as a culture hasn't actually isn't really helping us, our children, our husbands, our families, our futures in the way that we expected it to. You mentioned uh, Marxism and communism a few times in relationship to feminism. How did the two work together? How is feminism a part of that? Well, as I mentioned before, you already had kind of these three legs of the stool of feminism, which was um, free love, uh, the occult and the restructuring of society. Well, if you look at, at communism, the, the stool legs are very similar. You have uh, free love, um, restructuring society and atheism. Um, so initially the two groups didn't like each other at all. There was, you know, this seemingly incompatible um, element because these were bourgeois women and you know, all of that didn't, didn't quite mingle. Um, but eventually they realized that if they could sort of get past the, the bourgeois woman piece that this these women could actually be incredibly valuable because they were relying on women. Um, what they wanted to do was influence women so that women would stop buying things. Um, and we can see this. It's it's mentioned first in um, it's certainly mentioned in the feminine mystique. And um, Betty Friedan says it's this awful thing, the power of purchase um, that she thinks that we need to get rid of. Um, but that this is what the communists wanted to do was to really shut down, you know, women spending money. 
Um, they obviously didn't think through it very well because, of course, when you have two incomes, suddenly you've got more money and you're buying more. And, you know, this is why we people have storage units for all the stuff that they have bought. Um, but that was really where they saw women as just this incredible asset that were, was going to help with the revolution and that they could just shut down their purchase pa purchasing power and get them on board to see how well women were treated in the Soviet Union with, you know, the children were taken away at birth for external care and abortions were available, you know, a dime a dozen. Um, it, it actually you didn't have to pay a dime. They were free. Um, that that was really the the model that they were presenting. So as soon as they figured out that these things were very interwoven, then it became just a very easy partnership. And that's you know why it exploded in the 60s and 70s the way that it did, because they were just so compatible um, as ideologies. You also mentioned uh, like LGBT and, mm -hmm. you know, gay rights and um, transgenderism. How do mm -hmm. those work together with feminism? Yeah, well, I think in a lot and in, in many ways they are a fruit of it. And if you look back at the LGBT movement, um, there they attach themselves. First of all, the feminism is always attaching itself um, to civil rights and and um, what was happening with African American or Black people. Um, so that was the first step. Was feminism would associate that you see that in nineteen sixties or sorry eighteen sixties and seventies, and you also see it, of course, in the nineteen fifties and sixties. Um, and someone in um, w one of the homosexual leaders realized, like, we can attach ourselves to this movement as well and call it a civil right issue by redefining ourselves as a minority. Um, and no one had ever done that before that. No one ever thought of themselves that way. Um, and so that that was really how they sort of tucked themselves into this sense of victimhood um, was because they be, they suddenly become, became this oppressed minority. Um, and so from there, you know, even though there's really very little overlap between, you know, gays and lesbians and trans, I mean, we see some of that infighting today. Um, it, it was one of those things where they just sort of hitched their wagons and, you know, the lesbians <laughs> decided to be quiet about how much they hated the gay men and vice versa, um, because they just saw that it was going to be more effective if they were united together instead of that they worked independently of one another. Um, so that's really how how it's come about. But it's a very tenuous relationship because, of course, the lesbians hate men and the men, you know, there's just there's so many different dynamics at work um, in those same sex relationships that are, you know, are very different from heterosexual relationships. So, um, and then of course the trans comes after it, although of course the, you know, cross-dressing and dr being in drag and none of that was new. That was, some of that was happening very early on. And, um, but the acceptance of it as just another letter in the alphabet, um, you know, that needs to be embraced just as much as the others that those are certainly new ideas um but again come from this idea of plasticity and and getting rid of our our gender and that was really the the whole goal of the 1970s feminists was to just get rid of gender altogether they just wanted people to be kind of genderless and engage with whomever they wanted at any point and you know everything was, was conventions so what are the broader implications or effects of feminism on society? You know, what are some of the other things that uh, it has mm. spilled into that people, you know, might take for granted? Yeah. Um, well, certainly that the family is the most obvious one um, where you've got so much destruction to the family. You've certainly got it with children. You know, when we've told our, we, this was one of the other myths of, of the 1970s was this idea that children just are, you know, brought up. They don't have to be raised. They don't have mm. to be mother. Um, and I, I think we see that, you know, now that we're, what, three generations in, we're seeing the dramatic effects of that in terms of what's happening to our children. They don't, mm. they haven't had a feminine mother. They haven't had a masculine father. They haven't had enough time of being engaged by their parents and loved and, you know, just accepted as who they are. So, of course, we're going to see all, all of this mental illness and all these layers of, of dysfunction that seem very attractive and um, especially when you've got these promises of influencers to, you know, love you virtually and whatnot. Um, so uh, that is another um, layer of it. I think, too, you know, you can just see kind of the corruption um, of academia, of Hollywood, of politics. You know, all of these different areas of public life have really taken on the feminist cast. There's not one area. Um, in fact, even book publishing, um, secular book publishers will not publish pro-life books. Um, these are, uh, you know, we're just 
sort of shut out as um, any kind of alternative voice to feminism. So it's ve- the tentacles are very, very deep and widespread. And, um, you know, I think touch on so many of the different things that we deal with on a day to day basis, which is what is amazing, because that's how they keep us sort of, you know, locked into it, because you don't ever think there's another way to live. You know, you're just sort of like frozen in this belief system of this is how women should be. And um, and the, the, the remarkable thing is the women that I see that reject it usually had or that know that there's something else usually had like an amazing mom or amazing grandmother. Or they had someone else in their life that sort of showed them a different way. Um, but hardly ever does it come because, you know, they were watching The View. Um, there's the popular culture is not the way to find any kind of alternative to this. Right. And their mothers, in many cases, their grandmothers were, mm-hmm. you know, a byproduct of the feminist movement and don't mm-hmm. know how to show them how to yeah. be good wives, good yeah. mothers or, or women yep. in general. Yeah. No, we have, I mean, at least two or three generations of this that um, it makes it very difficult for us to even figure out how to be women um, because we've all been sort of funneled into this, like we need to be like men. Um, and I know that was my experience. I actually had a lot of really great male friends who along the way would say like, men don't really like it when women do that. And, you know, that just with little things here and there. And actually at one point in my life, I noticed that um, several of my ex-boyfriends married kindergarten teachers. And I thought, what what do the kindergarten teachers have that I don't have? And, you know, much of it was just kindness and a smile and, you know, wanting, willing the good of another and not being, feeling like you had to be overly ambitious or narcissistic or, um, you know, climb the ladder or whatever. Um, So I, I think that is another aspect, another area where um, healing can happen that men can influence women in very subtle ways um, is just saying like that you at you behaving like that is not actually working for your your benefit I think those kinds of friendships are can can give great gifts men can give great gifts to, gifts to women um, through those little tips what are some ways that you know women who today who maybe are listening to this and this is the first time they've heard this or maybe a man who wants to share this with his wife, what's the way back? Like, what are some of the first steps uh, after acceptance to coming back home? Yeah, no, I think that's a great thing. I mean, the first thing is, first of all, to realize we've been lied to tremendously. Um, And, you know, that there's actually nothing wrong with being at home. In fact, our bodies are a home. They're made to be a home. All of my children, their first home was in my body for nine months. Um, so that's why one of the reasons why home is such a, an important element. And I think, you know, a lot of women, their home is really an extension of their personality and in one degree or another, you can see, um, you know, the different way. And that doesn't mean we all have to have perfect homes. That's not, I, I think the goal, but it's just to recognize that there's a, a key issue about home that we've neglected for so long because we've been told it's a con- comfortable concentration camp. Um, but so the first thing is to really just start looking into how we've been manipulated. Um, I think the second thing is to just even look at our um, the things that you value and love because the biggest problem seems to be really this idea of narcissism and women not ever being wrong. Women are always victims. Um, you know, looking at the, those areas in our lives where we've sort of lived with this expectation um, that those are natural ways in which women um, can behave. Um, you know, being really rude or awful to your husband or your children or to anyone, and then expecting to be get away with it um, and without apologizing and now growing in virtue and you know because you're a woman. Um, you know, I think that that is a really hard thing to do to look. In, interiorly and say, where are the places where I'm acting out of really vice um, because I've been told that I can behave this way. Um, so I think that's really important. And of course, the, you know, the, the bigger, bigger element of is really to get back in right relationship with God. Um, because once that happens, once you have a prayer life, once you um, recognize that you are a made by God, you're a daughter of God, the father, um, that you have this very special relationship there, then it, then you, then it's easier to get rid of the noise. It's easier to hear his voice and behave in a way that's virtuous and beautiful in the way that you're meant to act instead of the way the world is telling us to act, which is, you know, toxic femininity, I, th- I think is the, the, the easiest way to define it. 
Right. And the subtitle of your uh, your book, The Mary mm-hmm. Ante Mary Exposed. I think that's a good right. segue into that kind of a conversation where I wonder what your thoughts are or, you know, maybe I even got this idea from you, but I'm going to propose it um, mm-hmm. that, you know, it, we could look to the rejection of Mary as a, mm-hmm. as a, as a, as a venerable icon, as, a, as an example for us, for women, uh, obviously a byproduct of the Protestant movement. Um, mm-hmm. How does, how does the anti-Mary attitude that a lot of people have, or just the complete rejection mm-hmm. of Mary, the mother of God mm-hmm. play into the spread of feminism? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and this was really what got me thinking about all of this from the very beginning was I was looking at um, Hillary Clinton was running for president. And I thought, this is a woman who doesn't just she's not like she hasn't shifted a little bit on Christian morals, but she's diametrically opposed to the the values that Our Lady represents, whether it's, um, you know, being pro-life, being humble, being, uh, you know, loving her son, you know, all of these kinds of elements. Um, and it, it, from there, I started just thinking about all the elite women in the culture and how very few of them actually embody anything, you know, like who Our Lady is. And the, the hard thing is, of course, Our Lady feels very saccharine and very um, removed, I think, from kind of our daily experiences. I, I know growing up, it was really hard for me to sort of approach her. I was very devoted to the, the rosary, but I always felt very um, separate from her. Like I couldn't really relate to her. And I think some of that is, be- again, we've been fed so many lies about who she is. Um, but the, the key thing is really just this recognition that, she, you know, here's a woman who God chose to be the mother of his son. She had this very special vocation. Um, and I think that that's something that most of us can relate to, you know, that we have this sense that God is, can, God can use us, that we have a vocation, that we have a mission. Um, I think that that feels like a very compelling aspect because we want all of our lives to feel like they have meaning and to not feel like we're just chasing our tails or that we're, you know, wasting our time or, you know, we get to the point where we're 70, 80 years old and think, what have I done with my life? Um, so I, I think that's a way that we can kind of approach her as well. Um, but yeah, the, the important element is just even to see, you know, how much Our Lady as as a woman um, really has helped women throughout history. I mean, women, the, the Catholic Church is actually the, has treated women the best out of any religion in all of history. Um, but largely because, you know, certainly because of Christ and the way that he treated women um, when he walked the earth. But much of it came later in the, you know, seven, eight, ninth centuries um, because people had this devotion to Mary and started understanding more deeply her role and how, you know, she is this model of femininity and of womanhood and, and um, realizing certainly through the lives of religious women and whatnot, that there's a model that women can follow. And um, that's really where joy and, um, and happiness come from. I love it. I know you and I both uh, know Anthony. He introduced me to you from 21 convention. Mm-hmm. Last right. year, I did a talk for his uh, for the woman's talk, and it was mm-hmm. very much influenced by your Marian Option book and the Anti Mary Exposed. And I spoke That's about awesome. how uh, you know, as I reverted to the faith, uh, it was through Mary that I was able to draw my daughters in. I have three daughters, mm-hmm. and having not really raised them in the faith, but then coming to it later in life, uh, it was by the graces of of Mary and her her feminine essence. And as an example for, you know, the perfect woman that I was able to draw, the, yeah. draw their hearts to Christ through, yeah. they say through Mary to Christ, right? Yeah, no, and that's really beautiful. And I think that the key is we haven't, we haven't seen this kind of womanhood, but we know it, we have a desire for it. We, when we see it, there's something in us that is drawn, really drawn to it. Um, and I, I think that that's just a fundamental a female, um, really a gift that we have. Uh, and that's one of the beauties that that happens with it. I, I think, um, you know, trying to help people understand her it goes so far if we can get beyond just kind of the saccharine, sugary sense of, of who she is. Do you notice a shift happening in the culture, a positive shift to move in the right direction? You know, I do, actually. I, I've been really surprised by it. Um, I know my book is about the fourth this year. Um, kind of beating on the wall of these issues a little bit. Um, uh, Peachy Keenan just came out with one domestic extremist. Um, is that what it's called? Yeah, domestic extremist. Um, and there's a couple others that have come out that are 
talking about all these issues, you know, whether it's um, the pill or just the way women are being treated sexually and whatnot. So it seems like people are starting to think about this a little bit more constructively and not just go along with the, the, the trends um, that, you know, we've been offered being using a lot more critical thinking. Um, I'm super encouraged by what's happened with target. Um, you know, that in, in terms of people finally saying enough is enough, we are not going to shop at target or, you know, Bud Light or whatnot. I think people are, are really seeing, um, that we've got to act. And, um, you know, even just, I, you've probably noticed it too, this June, you know, we're still June. And I've, I've been amazed at how much less the rainbow flag has been out there. I mean, it's still out there everywhere, but it feels less um, to me than it was even last year. Um, so I, I think that th there is a, a movement going in the right direction. And I think people, again, suffering really makes people think. People are really suffering in ways that as a, as a culture, we haven't suffered whether it's, you know, financially or disease or, you know, all the things that we've been facing, um, even a, a lot of uh, misinformation and, and, you know, all the t sort of tyrannical things that are happening in the culture. People are beginning to pay attention to them in ways that I think we just trusted before. Um, so that is really heartening because I think when you start seeing it in one area, then it's easier to say, well, maybe <laughs> we've been duped in another area too. Um, and that, I think that's, that's great for, for all of us. Yeah, I you know sometimes I think it's confirmation bias, and I kind of live in a bubble, and I'm like, hey, it looks like, like there's sort of an awakening happening. But I, I've heard other people say the same thing. It's amazing, and so yeah. I have three daughters, uh, three young ladies, uh, doing my best to raise them with uh, traditional values. My wife is, we homeschool, and she's you know mm -hmm. we had all of our, all of our children at home. Um, I'm curious if you'd be willing to maybe paint a picture for what a woman could be, uh, yeah. but, but, but shying away from maybe the weak image that is portrayed by feminists uh, yeah. when it comes to you know, true femininity. What, mm -hmm. what is possible for women that maybe they never heard before? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And this is actually really what my second book, Theology of Home, um, The Spiritual Art of Homemaking was about. Noelle Maring and I wrote that book because we don't have a grammar to speak about women anymore. We've been told to be like men so much that we don't even know how to think about, well, what does it look like to be a healthy, ordered woman? Right. Um, and, you know, I think in my own life, just even looking at how my life changed from, um, you know, when I became a mom and what what happened to me in many respects was that I, you know, I became much more um, focused and fierce in terms of trying to help my own children and trying to f um, raise them well. Um, and I think it, it, it's fierce is, might not be the right word, but I think the idea is focused and become being pulled out of ourselves. And and there's something very wonderful about, you know, we love it when we're pulled out of ourselves when we're when we're caught up in a movie or we're caught up in a painting or we're caught up in um, something that, that delights us. Um, but there's something about raising children and being a mother that pulls you out of yourself. And I, I remember after my fourth, I mean, my third child was born, um, I was still trying to finish my PhD. I was working on my dissertation. I mean, it was really a hard, hard period of time, but for some reason I had all this joy in my life and I thought, where is this coming from? Like, is this just adrenaline? Cause I'm too tired or, but it just persisted. And I, I realized it was because I was really doing what God wanted me to do. And I was, um, I wasn't afraid of the suffering anymore. And I think that that's the beautiful thing is when you start saying, I will do this because I love someone else. Um, that's really where a woman has her influence and her um, capacity to bring about the most good is when she's no longer saying, well, what's it, what's in it for me? But she's saying, how do I love these people the way that they need to be loved how do i help my husband how do i you know all of these things come together um so i think that that's an important thing but there's so many amazing um it, you know it feels like just an area that i would love to tap into more i would encourage other women who are are interested in this topic to to dig into it more too we have so many amazing saints we have so many amazing um even religious life the women that you know we have all these nuns being mocked right now um these are incredible women that they the things that they are doing for society you know completely behind closed doors that nobody ever sees um so i think that that's an aspect too of womanhood that um doesn't get downplayed or it gets downplayed too much we feel like we have to be loud and make noise and be seen and um you know so much of it is 
is not that way. And yet that's where the fruit and the joy really, really are. Right. And so we're talking a lot about women here today. And there's a tendency, I, I know, in the, the men's space to, at this point, be very angry. There's a lot of guys that are angry yeah. and they're pointing right. fingers. And, you know, yep. here we're having a conversation about why maybe they are angry with women. Yeah. Um, you know, before we wrap up, I'm, I'm curious what you would say to a woman in terms of what she should look for or expect from men, because it takes two to tango. Yeah. Well, I mean, first, I'd love to address the, the men who are angry. Um, I totally get the anger. I, you know, I experienced the anger a lot during my research and just the frustration of it. But I think one of the things that has finally really hit home with me and I've been able to communicate it with other men is that we women have been brainwashed. We don't even know how like most of the things that we've taken on. We didn't take on because we wanted to take them on. They, we took them on because the culture put you know, foisted them upon us. And I think when you start seeing it that way, suddenly it's a lot easier to be compassionate and sort of feel like you're on this mission to undo that instead of like, I hate you. <laughs> you know, I hate everything you stand for. I hate the way you are abusing men and, and the family and destroying our lives and the manipulation, you know, all of those things. Um, and really get into that part of like, she doesn't even know that she's been so brainwashed and and manipulated by the culture um so i think that that's that's actually a much better place to start because it diffuses the anger and it makes you feel a sense of compassion towards women um in a way that I, most of us i think didn't have wouldn't experience it otherwise um but i think you know the biggest thing for for women is really just you know i didn't get married until i was 34 and I, I think I see it in my, I saw it in myself, I see it in other people is the sense of, well, I'm never going to find somebody that's going to meet my standards. So I should just lower my standards. And um, I think that's the kind of the worst thing that we can do because it comes from a place of despair um, and the sense that, you know, God could never make a, a person that would be good enough for me. Um, and I understand that sense. And, you know, I, I have an amazing husband and um, he was actually, he's nine years older than I am. So he had to wait even longer than I did. Um, but I think that it, it's that sense of wanting, knowing that what you are doing as a single person is going to affect your marriage dramatically. It's going to affect your children's lives. Like I started praying for peaceful children long before I met my husband. I thought I, I just didn't want spazzy children. So I've been praying for peaceful children for since my 20s. Um, and, you know, I have pretty peaceful children for the most part. But I think that to, to not wait until you get married or until you meet somebody to start really living your femininity is an, is an important aspect to start doing it in ways that you can. Um, either as a great aunt or a good friend to people or, um, you know, in the manifold different ways, no matter where you're called, you can still treat people with respect and give them the space to be who they are instead of, you know, forcing yourself upon them, which I think is what happens so often in this, you know, very overdrive, ambitious girl boss kind of culture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just a matter of, of living it before. And then you're going to attract the kind of person that wants that instead of feeling like things have to be tinkered once you get married or, um, you know, once you've, um, or maybe you've gotten into a relationship you shouldn't have gotten into, but you thought, well, there's nobody else. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's just patience and really being true to who God made you to be. And, and a lot of times, you know, I, I think people mishear me and think, oh, that means you don't work or you don't, you know, follow your dreams or goals. And I don't, I'm not saying that at all. I think God made so many of us so different and um, with different gifts and different goals. So it's just a matter of discerning them properly, but doing that in a way that respects, uh, you know, who you are and doing it in a virtuous way instead of, um, you know, grabbing at something. Carrie, thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure to speak with you and to know you and to read your books. I found you on Instagram, or at least uh, I was connected to you through Instagram. What are some yeah. of your other social platforms, YouTube, anything that we can uh, Yeah. Um, I My blog is theologyofhome.com. Um, my co-author, Noelle Maring, and I put out um, eight articles a day for women that we go through and we make sure there's not, you know, you don't, you don't have to worry about reading it in front of your 10-year-old son or anything like that. Um, things that we know women are interested in, but that we're not 
helping women as, as certainly as Catholic women, but I know it, it has a much broader appeal. We have all kinds of people that read our stuff. Um, so we do that every Monday through Friday. Um, that's probably the best place to, to find us and find all of the different things that Noelle and I are doing. Noelle has a book called Awake Not Woke. So she's on similar fronts as I am, but kind of a- approaching it from a different angle. Um, so that's probably the best place to find us. We're also, Theology of Home is also on Instagram and on Facebook as well. Mm-hmm. Cool. And your new book, The End mm-hmm. of Women. The End of Women, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. That will be out with Regnery Press on August 15th, but it's available for pre-order. And if people want signed copies, they can get that from um, theologyofhome.com. I'm happy to um, send signed copies from, from our store. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, signing off. I appreciate you. And uh, maybe we'll link up again soon.